Hey everybody, welcome back to Spiritual Conversations with your host, Drake Miller. I am so thankful to be back. I hope you had a wonderful week and weekend last week. I know I did. Uh, last weekend, we actually went on a youth trip with our youth group. We went up to the Gatlinburg area and had a wonderful time of connecting with each other. We had wonderful conversation, made some many great memories, and I really am thankful to all who were involved in the planning and the execution of that weekend. It was great, and wherever you were at, whether you were vacationing in the mountains or whether you were having to work all weekend, you know, whichever one, I hope you had a wonderful time and, and really also having a time in the presence of God. We, we have had such wonderful moves of God. I, I feel like I say that every time, but it's true every time we have entered into a, a place of revival and a place of when God is really moving. And that's true, not just for our local church here at Restoration Apostolic, but it's true across the board. I am hearing from friends across the state and friends across the nation, everywhere you could imagine. They're saying that God is really pouring out his spirit upon all flesh. And and that is perfectly in line with what scripture says. And it just makes me so excited and it makes me want to urge you if you aren't able to get in the house of God for whatever reason, please try to change things around, get to the house of God some way. I promise I can assure you, you will be blessed. And wherever you're at, however you spend your time, I hope you always are able to enjoy time with friends and family because people need people. I feel like I have said that almost every episode, but it's true every episode. People need people. So love people, love your friends, love your family, and enjoy being time around them. We all need it. And for the past few weeks, we have been talking about the word of God. We started out with a simple question of do you know him? A few weeks ago, I asked that question, and and him being the one called the Word of God, do we actually know Christ? And it was established in that episode that the Word is not just a book, but the Word is a man, and that man is Jesus Christ. And we were then admonished to insist upon the literal interpretations of the Word of God and realizing that it's not just a written book to be analyzed, but the Word of God is the inspired, spoken, God-breathed word that proceeded out of the mouth of the Most High and was recorded in Scripture that we might come to know Him. And we ended our discussion coming to the realization that just as I alluded to, all things were written that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing we might have life through His name And it was also written that we might hide his words in our heart, that we might not sin against God. And last week, I gave some very practical advice on how to tap into the truths of the Lord, including read methodically and find some reading aids, and above all, read, fast, and pray. And I just want to conclude that whole series by saying this, if you don't know the Lord your God today, Turn your life to Jesus Christ. He's waiting. He is calling. It was said in a prayer meeting a few days ago, the walls are broken. The power of the devourer is broken. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Do it while there's time. Grow a relationship with him. Get in his word. Get to know Jesus Christ. Allow the word to change you. I promise you will be glad that you did. And today, I'm starting a series called, What Makes the Difference? This was actually inspired by a a lecture in my art history class. We were talking about ancient Rome, and we had gotten to the point where Christianity starts to really rise a lot in, in Roman culture. And my professor said an interesting statement. She said, what made the difference with the Christians versus any 
other religion in the past was the Messiah. And needless to say, I was not thinking much on art history for the remainder of that lecture because God began to deal with me on what really makes the difference. And it's the Messiah, and it is the greatest love story ever told. The question, what makes the difference? It's a question that calls for great explanation and defense of this great faith that we've been given. It's a question which provides a launching pad, a wellspring of opportunity to tell, as I said, the greatest love story ever told, to minister rather than preach and somehow convey the amazing message of Jesus Christ and his love. Because truly, what does make the difference? Some might say that it's the fact that we have the inspired, God-breathed Word of God. I'll buy that. But there are others who claim they, and not we, have a complete revelation. And some might say it's our hope for eternity in a far better place better place than this, and I'd agree with that, considering ours is a city not made with hands, but other ideologies still claim this too. Or maybe it's our moral law, some might say. It's our commandments, our good character, and how we treat people, and I'd buy that, because we do have the only true moral law and code of ethics, according to Proverbs, but even secular Philosophy, which does not even recognize a higher power, claims to have the universal moral code. So there must be something more. And that something more is the greatest love story ever told. And that love story is this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And a more modern writer wrote on the walls of an insane asylum many years ago. Could we with ink the oceans fill and were the skies of parchment made? Were every stock on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the oceans dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. O oh, love of God, how rich and pure! How measureless and strong it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. Both aged and new, whether gospel or song, the greatest love story and message is this, my friend. God loves you. And on a majestic night, when the love of God became tangible and the Word became flesh, which was the night of our Savior's birth, these words were trumpeted by the angelic being in the midst of those ordinary shepherds when he said, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace and goodwill towards men. These shepherds walked and they found a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. But they knew him as Christ. They understood that this child was the lamb for sinner slain. They understood that he was the lamb slain from the foundations of the world. And I pray in these few short moments, I can tell you of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who is Christ the Lord. I pray that I can show you a truth that stands more than any other truth that Jesus Christ loves you. This child was all man, but he was all God. For in him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That testifies that this child is the breath of life, and he was the ram caught in the thicket. He's the blood-covered door, and he's the Passover lamb. He is our high priest, the fire by night, and the cloud by day, and he's Moses' voice. He is salvation's choice, the lawgiver and the kinsman redeemer. He is our trusted prophet. He is sovereign. He is true and faithful's cry, and he's a rebuilder of broken walls and lives. He is Mordecai's courage, 
the timeless Redeemer, and our morning song. He is wisdom's cry in the time and season. This child is the lover's dream. He's the prince of peace. He's the weeping prophet, and he is the cry for Israel. He is the call from sin and the promised new spirit. He was the stranger in the fire that Daniel saw, and he's the basest of men. He is forever faithful. He's the Spirit's power, and he's the arm that carries us. He is Lord, our Savior. He is the great missionary. He's the promise of peace and our strength and our Redeemer. He is forever pleading for revival. He restores the lost heritage, and he is our fountain, and the sun of righteousness rising with healing in his wings. And I've come to tell you today, my friend, he loves you. This child is God and Messiah. He is the fire from heaven. He's the grace of God. He's the power of love. He is the freedom from the curse of sin. He is our glorious treasure. He has a servant's heart. He is the God in one. He is our coming king, our mediator and our faithful pastor. He he is the everlasting covenant and the one who heals the sick. He is our shepherd. He is the overseer of the overcomers. He is the lover coming for his bride. He is the king of kings and he is the Lord of lords. He is Alpha and Omega, our God and our Savior. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord, and he loves you. The same God that created in Genesis loves you. He loves you. From the Genesis to the Revelation, the story is the same. Jesus loves you and he loves me. The only and one true deity, the infinite creator who holds the winds in his fist and makes the clouds his chariots the one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills and all the silver and gold in the hills. He whose words alone created the stars also and in whose hand our very breath is, he loves us all. He loves all without exception. God loves indiscriminately all races, creeds, and colors, red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. Jesus loves all all the children of the world. And my friend, he loves you. He loves you. Jesus Christ, the predestined Lord, loves you. He loves all of us, each individual in distinction. It's not deep, but it's profound. It's the most profound elevating and comforting news which was ever flashed from the throne of God and which broke like a sunrise on this earth. Knowing Jesus loves you, it is a truth you can live with and it is a truth you can die by. God so loved. Friend, God loves you. Our God loves He doesn't just command. He doesn't just hide behind some veil demanding we do all this that he might be appeased as some other religions do. No. Our God loves. And God so loved the world. Friend, it's not his will that any should perish, but all would come to repentance and knowledge of him, no matter how far you are, no matter how long you've stayed away, no matter how much you have messed up. God loves you. Jesus Christ died for you. There is not one soul, including yours, that God does not love. And God so loved the world that he gave. He gave all. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe on him should not perish but have everlasting life. He gave his only begotten son whose name is Jesus Christ. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commanded his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God commanded his love for us. It wasn't a suggestion. It didn't come 
by the clause or requirements. God commanded his love towards all people, even the ungodly. While we were yet sinners, while we were yet in sin, Christ laid down his life for us. That means he knew the worst thing you would ever do. He knew how much you would go against his law. He knew how much you would sin against him. He knew how much we would fall short of the glory of God. He knew our life and actions at one point would make all of us no better than those who cried, crucify him. Yet he looked at us with love in his eyes and said, Father, forgive them. That was the cry then, and that is the cry now. As he continually makes intercession for us, he makes intercession out of love. We were once just like those who cried, crucify him. And yet he still loved us. Friend, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And his only begotten son, whose name is Jesus, is said to be the lamb for sinners slain. He was slain for sinners, for the worst of sinners. That's the cause of redemption. You who feels as if you have no hope, you are the very one Christ came for. He's looking for you. He loves you. He didn't come in magnificent robes or royal garb. He didn't come with the greatest wealth. No, my friend, he came out of the womb of a virgin girl, was born in a manger in the city of Bethlehem, and made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He laid aside his royal robes of splendor for a borrowed peasant's gown. He traded all the riches of heaven to work as a carpenter by day and a high priest by night. He who knew no sin was a friend of sinners, taking their sin so they might be free. He left the sounds of a holy eternity where angels cry, holy, 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 and he traded it in for a crowd crying, crucify, crucify, crucify. He loves us so much. He became one who was despised and rejected of men. He was known as a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. He walked everywhere he went with love in his hand, and he spoke with love in his mouth, even when they mocked him to his face and plotted against him behind his back. He stood there with the greatest expression of love on his face and held out redemption in his hand. Though we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him and he was whipped so that we could be healed. Jesus loves you, my friend. He loved us so much that he was cut off from the land of the living. And for the transgression of my people was he stricken. Yet God commanded his love towards us and Christ died for us, meaning he made himself an offering for sin that we might, through his blood, live eternally with him. He did all of this just so he could live with you and me. He went through all the pain just so he could reinstate communion with his creation. He paid a debt that we could not pay just so he could show his love towards us and we might live with him again. He so loved that when the world condemned us and when our mind even now may imprison us with memories of our wrongdoing and words of condemnation, he looks at us and says, I don't condemn thee. Go free. Why did he love us? I have no idea, nor did King David when he cried, 
What is man, that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man, that thou visited him? Yet the word did become flesh. Jesus Christ dwelt among us, and he was tried in every single way that we are, except he did not sin. He came to where we are. He experienced all of it. He walked with us. He walks with us now. He loves us. Why did he allow his countenance to be more marred than any man, being, being beaten to the point he was not recognizable, even though we know in our flesh dwelleth no good thing? Oh, my friend, I want you to stop right now and imagine in your mind and hear the cry of a man hanging on a cross for six hours. He's been stripped of all his clothes and had a whole band of soldiers beat him relentlessly, yet he didn't say a word. He had a crown of thorns beaten onto his head and a reed placed in his right hand, and he was mocked by all those around him, even spat on. He had been tortured so bad and was so weak that he could not carry his own cross up the mountain, but they compelled Simon to help him. And when he made it to the mountain, it didn't stop there, for they thrust him down on the ground, reinciting all the pain in his body. And then they continued to drive nails through his hands and feet. And they lifted the cross up, allowing it to fall into the hole, jarring his whole body, reinstating once again all the pain. And when he simply cried, I thirst, they gave him vinegar. He hung there, his flesh peeling off of his body and blood flowing out of even his most internal parts. He was writhing in pain and agony, yet he stayed, yet he loved. Stop and imagine the scene for a moment. That one which I just described is named Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Jesus loves you. I cannot tell at all how much Jesus Christ loves you. Do you believe it? And he loved us enough to dwell three days in a borrowed tomb, descend into hell where he took the keys of hell and death from Satan himself, then be raised up from the dead by the power of of the Holy Ghost, and it was then the Spirit that worketh in him testified of him among men before he ascended into heaven, sat at the right hand of the Father, and now makes intercession for us, waiting for us to come home. My message is this. Jesus Christ loves you. And he did all this. He left his splendor and majesty, came down and dwelt among men, and died a horrible death so that we might come in repentance to him who is faithful to forgive and that we might then be buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father even so we should also be raised up and walk in newness of life and look towards eternity with him. So friend, be of good cheer as Paul said, I say unto you, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Christ died so you could. Christ died so you could come into the kingdom and you could cry having received the spirit of adoption, cry, Abba, Father, and be counted as a son of God. And to my friends who claim to live for Christ, I admonish you today, love the way Jesus loved, love God, and love people. This has been the cry of the church for the past few weeks, and I want to join that choir of ministry and say to all who are listening, First, love God. Second, love people.
love God, and love people. Jesus, when asked which is the greatest commandment in the law, said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is likened unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And we are admonished not to love with a measurable love. But Jesus said, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved one to another. We must love not with a measurable love, but with an immeasurable love. We must love as he did and give all. We must first love God and second people and love one another as Christ loved us and he loved so much he gave all. We must love so much that we give everything we got. I've said this many times to different people and I say it here. Love people until it hurts. We must love the way Jesus loved. It's the only way to show the difference to our world and make a difference in the lives of people. And this love I speak of is an undying, agonizing, never ceasing, always reaching love. Encouraging some and pulling others out of the fire every day of our life. John said, by his sacrifice and his great act of sacrificial love, we know love because he laid down his life for us and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. If we are truly lovers of God, then we ought to be lovers of people. If we aren't, scripture calls us liars. Friend, we must love one another. We must make a difference in the lives of people. We have nothing if we've not made an impact in the lives of people. C.S. Lewis one time, he said, If I could go back and do my whole life over again, I would do it so that I change the lives of people. And you change the lives of people by loving the lives of people. Loving people is when you hate not your brother, when you choose not to take vengeance nor bear any grudge against those around you. Loving people is when you love your neighbor as yourself. Loving people is choosing not to fight those when they come against you, but meet them with a soft voice, for a soft voice turns away wrath. It's choosing not to retaliate, but to choose peace over being right. It is turning the other cheek when someone slaps you. It's going two miles when one asks you to go one. Loving people is being a little listening ear having an understanding heart, compassion towards one another, and working to relate to all men so you can encourage them towards virtue and salvation. Loving people is laying your life down every single day for those around you. Friend, what makes the difference? Love makes the difference. Love makes the difference in our lives in eternity and in our lives now. Love is what bought our salvation and gives us access to eternal life. It is what freed us from the chains of sin. The love of God is what births inside all of us a love for people. It's what causes us to feed the hungry and give drink to the thirsty, take in the stranger and clothe the naked. Love is what causes us to visit those who are in prison and take care of the sick. It compels us to care for the orphan and the widow. And friend, most of all, love is what causes us to go out into the highways and the byways, spending our life compelling them to come in. Love is what causes us to share the good news of the kingdom, that heaven has come near. And if you just repent, be baptized and accept the gift of the Holy Ghost, you will be made a citizen of heaven. It's telling people that we know where you can come and drink of the water freely so that you may never thirst and eat of the bread so you may never hunger. 
Love is what makes the difference. In closing, I realize that I have the best news any human being in the world could ever hear. And I'm determined to share this difference-making love story with all who will will hear it. Friend, I do hope you were blessed this week. I hope that you have peace and joy. If you have a home church, I pray you and your church are blessed beyond measure this week. And if you don't, and you're in the Athens area, I would love for you to be my guest at Restoration Apostolic Church, 110 Moores Grove Road, Winterville, Georgia. And if you don't have a home church and you don't live near here, please reach out to me. I would love to help you. I can help you find a church in your local area. To all of my college friends out there, I can help you find a college ministry if you aren't already plugged in with the field at UGA. In closing, if there's any way I can help you, please reach out to me on social media or through email at spiritualconversations.drake at gmail.com. And until next time, thank you and be blessed.